High atop New York State's Shawangum Mountains is Sam's Point Preserve. The preserve has drawn generations of people to its unique landscape and spectacular views. The mountain's bountiful huckleberries once spurred a fruit gathering industry that continued until the late 1960s. Each summer, families came to earn money picking berries. For many, the mountain became a place that they longed to return to year after year. No artist could ever paint what nature planned in the making of Sam's Point and Mar Lake Maritanza. I fell in love with it the first time I ever went up there. There's something about the air up there. It's, it's refreshing to get up out of the valley, get away from everything. For me, the mountain's heaven. <laughs> this is a friendly mountain. It is flat. It says, come, enjoy my fruits. Huckleberry pickers, this is a history that was lived right up in the mountain. The, the huckleberry pickers, their economic system, their social system, the, the history that distinguished them took place right in the mountain and was focused on the mountain, you know, on, on, on a resource of the mountain. I mean, these people spent more in the mountain, more time in the mountains than the Indians ever did, than the settlers ever did, than most hikers, campers ever did. Uh, they lived there. They lived there in some cases for a few months, every summer, year after year after year. Let the people who lived it talk and let us listen to their voices. Let the land speak and let us listen to what the land is saying. H.R. Stonebeck, Professor of American Literature, SUNY New Paltz. I picked huckleberries as a kid. My father picked huckleberries, my mother picked huckleberries, my brothers picked huckleberries, and my grandfather was one of the biggest berry buyers in the area. Our family, I think, started going probably in the late 1920s, and I was one of the last grandchildren to be there with my grandmother, and I think our last time up there was probably 1959, 1960, we stopped going up there. My mom and dad uh, picked berries many years before that, and we used to pick berries every summer to buy our school clothes. We would get up really quite early, much earlier than I wanted to get up, but that was the way it was. We did what we did. We'd have breakfast. Usually we'd have pancakes with huckleberries in them, naturally. And then we would take things that we were going to have for lunch, which meant a can of potted meat or a can of sardines. And then we'd go to wherever it was the best picking at that time. And then when it got noontime, it was time to eat. We'd, we had just water with us, or we would find a spring where there was water. And we picked all day. I ate many of the berries that I picked, but I still managed to pick enough to sell. And early evening, we'd go down near Stedner's store where the buyer would be. But when it got dark, everybody went inside and closed the door and we settled down for the night. There was no phone, no electric, nothing. But it was absolutely so peaceful and wonderful. The memory still makes me warm when I think about it. You would find yourself a patch, what they call the patch. And that's about where you'd end up all day because berries were laid in there like grapes. I mean, they were, there was berries all over. It wasn't picking a berry here and picking a berry there. You got right in them, and there was many, many of them, and big. Well, most of the berry pickers that come up here, they had a big wide belt. And they put a basket on the belt, and they would take both hands and just, like an elevator or something, you know, just keep pouring them in. Willard York 
Um, he lived in Ellenville, but he came to, the, to Sam's Point every summer and stayed there and made all the berry baskets for us and people bought, you know, bought the baskets. I think sometimes um, the little kids, when the kids were there and stuff, he would just make the basket and give it, give it to them, you know. Willard also made uh, boxes with straps that we carried on our backs. They used to have a little hatch with a piece of leather strap that used to fasten down to keep the berries in once you kept piling the berries in. You'd fill your basket first, then pile the berries into the box, and you carry that on your back. And some of the boxes used to hold 30, 40 quarts of berries. Of course, the boxes we had as kids, he built the box according to the size of the character that was gonna be wearing it, you know. And uh, we used to pick a lot of berries and carry them around on our back. This is one of the original baskets that we picked berries in. This basket, I would say, is over 50 years old. Um, Willard York made all these baskets, and I'm sure it's probably gotten darker with age, but they usually sit up on top, all four of my baskets sit on top of my cabinet in the kitchen, and um, so they're like a real family treasure. <laughs> Grandpa, when he went, he'd be there with us for a few minutes, and all of a sudden he'd be gone. And he'd come back with two or three big pails of berries, and here we're struggling getting a little can. <laughs> he was he knew how to. Pay. He knew, and he knew where the berries was. I remember specifically picking anywhere from five to 25 quarts a day, but, and whether it was a good day or a bad day, didn't so much depend on the berries, because the berries are always there, it depend on the picker, whether or not you felt in the mood to pick berries or you want to have fun. And, 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 and I did eat a lot of berries, so maybe that's why I didn't have many, some good days, you know, didn't do as well as other days. I probably picked like 35 quarts, uh, but I think that's probably the most I ever did. I think I was, my biggest one was 21 or 22 quarts. That's, that was my limit. I didn't like to bend over those. They built too close to the ground. Well, there's one thing, that was hot work, because you're, you're out in the heat and you're on your hands and knees most of the time, and right down the ground, no breeze, and you wonder how you, you could stand it. Well, the high bush berry is, grows high. You stand up to pick it, and they're all black. Low bush was the huckleberry. Uh, a berry picker, a huckleberry picker wouldn't touch a high bush berry. That'd be insulting to him. We picked huckleberries, all kinds of huckleberries. And then days they had names. There was jugberries, there was silver blues, there was grays, there was blacks. They all had their distinct look and flavor. And we was, I was taught to be a clean picker. When I picked, there was no sticks, no green ones, no leaves. And we would get an extra penny or two from the berry buyer for having clean berries. The low bush berries, I remember for two cents a quart. 30 cents a day was like, you would like a millionaire, I man. Since I was one of the later ones that, you know, went up there, that we got up to like 30 cents a quart for our berries, I think. At the end of each day, buyers purchased the berries from the pickers. Berries were measured into quart containers, packed in crates, and transported locally to bakeries and hotels and to markets as far away as New York City and New Jersey. The berry buyer would come up and he would come in the evening. But he always had his table there, a trough. You dumped your, all your berries onto a table. He would hold probably 40 quarts. And the guy just there, pour them out of your box, out of your basket, fill the baskets up, level them up. Then, and the excess would run out to the end, catch them, then he'd re redo them for you. And he pays you for what you had. Berry pickers themselves, they come up in the, in the spring and they stayed all summer. They came from the city. They all came from the city. They had all different kinds of jobs, but they just loved that mountain. They had their own shacks up there. They'd come back to those old shacks. Tar paper shacks, tin, tin roof shacks, wooden shacks. We used kerosene lamps, of course, for light, and we had a kerosene stove to cook on. It was a cheap vacation for money, of you know. They uh, come up here tax-free, room-free. Back in the days, everybody came up and built their camp and nobody gave a damn who owned it. That's all it was to that. They congregated in certain places uh, where there were springs or brooks and, and, and uh, you know, with their own family groups. 
uh, and uh, you know it was it was the way settlement happens, uh, you know, uh, at its best, you know, sort of spontaneously and governed by the uh, the geography and the and the resources, the geographical resources uh, of the mountain. The first camp he went up through the gate on the left-hand road, about 200 feet, was the first cabin there. Then he went up to CC Camp with a few of them there. And then up in the, they call the Grove, which is a road between, behind, across from the old shale bank. Uh, about eight of them lived in there. Then you get up over there, then the German pickers. Done cooking outside. And by the way, the German berry pickers are excellent cooks. Oh, they could cook. Early in the spring, we would get chickens and baby chicks and raise them. And about the time berries came in, they would be just right for cutting up and frying. And so they were friars, they were called friars. And we have never, or I have never, tasted anything so good. I know one thing my grandmother made a lot was the macaroni with like tomatoes. And I'm so she, glad you're telling that story. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> and if we were able to have like onions and green peppers, she, you know, fry them up and put it in the tomatoes and then put the, um, tomatoes, a can of tomatoes, because we had a lot of canned food. We had no refrigerator. Once in a while, when one of the other family members would come up, they'd bring a block of ice for us, you know, which did not last long in the hot summer. But I have tried to duplicate that meal so many times, and never, never, never has it happened. And my tongue hangs out as she's describing it, because it was the most wonderful meal. It was excellent. The huckleberry pickers and their families spent long days harvesting berries. Most people spent evenings around the campfire, making music, telling stories, and socializing. He was a millstone cutter and a blacksmith too, and he sure did like his liquor. And when summertime come, just for the fun, he was a huckleberry picker. Bill played the mouth organ and the Jews harp too, oh we loved to jig and frolic. But of all these things, what he loved best to do was to be an alcoholic. <laughs> Well, most of the time, the nightlife wasn't much because everybody's so tired, but it seems like on the weekends, they always got together, and mostly the German people, but they, uh, they used to go down and, and they had a, we had a pan piano in, the, in that store, and that one, I think one, one guy had a violin and, uh, and the accordion, and uh, they, they used to go down and drink beer and, and uh, sing and, and have a good time for until, until they had to go home. <laughs> but that was usually on the, just the weekend, wasn't it? Yeah, usually on Saturday night, Sundays. and Sunday they recuperate, and one day they go back for picking berries. Well, we were the bad guys. My mother stole a little hooch and a little little beer and wine on the side, and they they come back in and they they get a snort, and then they go back out again and pick another gang, and they get another pebble to come in. The, they might make three, four trips a day, and mother would have them a cup of coffee every morning before they left. And these fellows, believe it or not, when they come back in, and I'm serious about this, when they come back in, they'd get a pail of water out of the spring, they had to walk in, give them, they all washed it, maybe it's cold water, but they all washed up and combed their hair, you know, and everything else. The pickers that lived up in the, where, where I picked, all them camps up in there, I can't name one to drink. They're not a one. They was all uh, teetotalers, that I'll tell you. Our big treat at the end of the day of picking uh, huckleberries was taking maybe 15 to 20 cents and going down to the little store at the entrance of the gate at the Sam's Point and we'd buy a bottle of my favorite was grape soda and perhaps a bag of potato chips and everybody would get together we'd just sit around and talk about what went on during the, the day and we'd sit and watch the little budding romances that took place during the summer that nobody wants to admit but other than that that was pretty much our entertainment other than climbing the ridges up in Sam's Point. Now this is a bottle that was made for my aunt and uncle down in New Jersey by the berry pickers. And one of the German pickers. And uh, I have one, a smaller one, and John has a smaller one. And uh, it's quite a piece of art. But they, uh, this is what they used to do on rainy days, besides this and making baskets. So whenever they couldn't pick berries, they had to find something else to do. So this, this is a very talented person that did this. The Shongum's scenic cliffs and plateaus make it one of Earth's last great places, 
It's home to more than 1,400 species of plants and animals. The ice caves over there, there are creases in the rock. And there was such a beautiful blast of cold air. When you get a westerly wind, this cold air would come up through the cracked crevices. And I can remember running as fast as I could down that to get to that cold, you know, air coming up. And you just, you know, stand there and it was like standing in front of a fan today, an air conditioning. But it happened to be Mother Nature's. It was, uh, that was a thrill. I liked that. In those days, all the ledges were clear. You could look down to the ledges a quarter of a mile or a half. You could see long ways, you know. And you stayed out of the other person's way. We all went to our own spot to pick and all that kind of stuff. You didn't, you didn't walk in on nobody. But we're down there, sister and I. I'm up there picking. My pail was just about full. I look down the rocks and I see this brown thing come up, or black, and I thought it was my dog. And I realized it was a bear. And I couldn't run. I was scared to death. I stood perfectly still. And I watched that bear coming up the ledges this way. I'm over here watching him. He's going to come within maybe 30, 40 feet of me. And I watched him grunt and groan as he come up, you know, nice and easy. So I changed the pail. For one hand, I'm going to bash him in the face with the pail. That's just how your mind works, right? You know, the fire. So the bear runs down, turns around and runs. Right past where my sister's picking in a bunch of ferns. So I get down there. I can't do the expression, but she's on her hands and knees. She's going like that. So I, when we got back home, I told the people that we saw a bear. No one, because back in those days, there were no bear here. Very, very, very few. No one believed us. So we was lying. But they shot the bear that, that fall. He weighed around 400 pounds. From the fire tower down on, on that side of the road, the Elmville side, there was rattlesnake. On the other side of the road, the Crawford side of the mountain, there was no rattlesnake. It was what they call a snake line. And I picked my father and my grandfather and myself had picked berries up there forever and never seen a rattlesnake. On the elbow side of the mountain, it was infested with it. We found a huge snake then, like a big pit in the ground, and it had thousands of snakes in it. When we seen it, we threw the berries and ran <laughs> back down to my parents. We never, ever saw a snake, a copperhead or a rattlesnake, although we did know that when we smelled cucumbers, go the other way, because that meant there were rattlesnakes. The kids were in a tent. Grandpa had pitched a tent, and we were in the tent, and I felt something on my face, and I, you know, brushed it, pushed it, and my, I said, hey, there's some animal in here, and Grandpa came with a flashlight. It was a skunk. Well, he, that, you know, he said, don't move, stay right still, right where you are, you know. And the skunk did check all around. He, you know, was looking for food, of course, but he did walk out, you know. And Grandpa then fastened, there were ties on the front of it, but we had not tied it shut, you know. So he said, well, you can untie these in the morning, but you leave them tight now. I've seen bobcats. And there's a lot of bobcats up on the mountain. Other people say, nah, you never see them. But I've seen them. Uh, you just gotta be quiet. <laughs> For thousands of years, fires have swept the Shawn Gums. Early people understood that fire improved the wild berry crop. Modern day berry pickers continued to use fire as a cultivation tool. By 1912, a fire tower was constructed at Sam's Point to monitor the frequent wildfires. I remember probably a teenager when the mountain became ablaze with, you know, you could see it burn down there. And at night, it was so dramatic because you could actually see the flames. And the berry pickers did that on occasions. They would burn it off so that you'd get a better, uh, you would get a better crop. Those days, you know, had a fire in the mountain, the forest rangers go through Ellenville. You, 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 come with me. And that was it. You go or you go to jail. I think the biggest fire I attended, I was like, I was about 20 years old. I just got out of service in 1947. It burned from 
Kimball Hose Firehouse in Allenville in Minnewaska. We were out there, I think, eight days. A couple nights I stayed out there all night. I never come home. Every year, a certain part of the mountain would go fire. And it didn't, my old, my old uncle was John Adams. He was a ranger there. It didn't hurt nothing. He just burned between the rocks. Let it burn. It's not going to hurt anything. And it takes two years, and they have a beautiful crop of berries. So we used to carry our drinking water and our uh, uh, tea. We used to drink uh, sun tea. We used to carry it in colored bottles back then. And colored bottles had a terrific magnification to them. And when we got done with the bottle, we'd hang it on a tree limb. Well, sometimes the sun just hit right, and there was a tinder patch around, and it went off. But uh, yeah, the berry pickers burnt the mountains off. Well, they claimed they used to take a turtle and tie a big, long rope knot on the back of him, soaked in kerosene, and let the turtle go, and he would set the fire. He would drag the, through the woods and set the fire. But don't ask me if it's true, but that's the, I've heard the story. Well, I've told you about that story about that old guy, how he, he used to, uh, I won't say his name this time, <laughs> and he used to take that possum, tar and feather him, and then he'd light him on fire and let him go through the berry woods, and that started the fires. What they used to do though, they used to get these white candles, and then when they get done picking berries and late in the season, they'd stack up some pine needles and put the candle in there, and they go home, and a couple hours later the candle gets down to the pine needles, and that's how they started them. They, were, they weren't in the area. It's they were involved. The berry picking industry finally ended in the late 1960s. Remains of at least seven berry picker shacks still exist at Sam's Point. These sites are reminders of a vanished native industry and the people associated with it, their profound sense of community, and their intimate connection to the land. In the 30s, there was very little work, and the mountain was full of berry pickers. I mean, it was good, honest work, and it paid decent. I mean, you know, when we hear, you know, eight cents a quart and so on and so forth, it sounds like nothing. But uh, there's people that paid off grocery debts from the year, you know. Uh, there's people that put some money away. Uh, uh, I mean, this was the best, a lot of those pickers, this was the best money they earned all year. And there's people who quit factory jobs or quit jobs as farmhands. I mean, steady full-time employment go up there and pick berries during the summer, not just because they liked it, but because they made more money at it. The 40s, completely different story. A lot of the young men were away to war. A lot of fat, you know, there was full employment everywhere. A lot of factory jobs, war-related factory jobs that became available to women for the first time, because so many of the men were in service. And so the only one left at the berry picking camps were the, the very elderly, the serious alcoholics, the you know those who couldn't read and write and at the end of the war when the war was over hype Addis said it best he said it was just a different world he said people didn't just go back to what they were doing before I and mean, there was so much had changed in the economy and so on and so forth i think probably the biggest thing responsible for it is that the, the cultivated blueberries uh once they took over were much easier to pick they were a lot more plentiful and uh, economically people just couldn't afford to come up and uh you know and stay for the summers and didn't make enough money off picking blueberries to, uh, to uh, continue doing it. I don't think you had the people that wanted to work on that job. Things you got, work was more plentiful, wages were better. The berry pickers died off and their kids didn't do it anymore. It just, uh, I would say modern days took over or something. There's, there was no more, there's no more berry pickers around. From time to time, I look up at the mountain and I'm overwhelmed with a, such a physical feeling which is quite like the same feeling you get when the flag goes by in a parade. It is a, a, an emotional bursting inside of the longing, the kindred feeling for that mountain. It still affects me that way and I am 80 years old. And it's just something about the mountain. You either love it or you hate it, one or the other. Uh, and I happen to love it. It brings your family closer together. 
because you were away from everybody. It was just nice up there. We were born and brought up here, and we just we went and left, but we always come back. We just made so many friends, and we had such a good time there that uh, you, you didn't think twice about going back year after year after year. We say the good old days. Well, the good old days were tough days, but they were good old days. They were simple. You know, life was simple back in those days.